This is the second part of our session on mass balance and the formation of glacier ice. Before watching this, you should have seen an earlier video where I was talking about mass balance and also I'm assuming that you're doing the follow up reading in the set textbook that will be adding some detail to the general points that I'm making here. The first thing I wanted to do was just look at a couple of uh, pictures to illustrate the ideas we've been talking about. This is, this is the volcano Cotopaxi in Ecuador and you can see here very clearly the difference between the accumulation area and the ablation area. Here at the top of the glacier, at the top of the ice cap, you can see bare snow on the surface and as we move down towards the edges you can see the snow runs out and is replaced. There's the last few dregs of snow in here and down here at the end of this little, this little outlet glacier that's bare ice on the surface. There's no snow remaining on the surface down here as everything is being melted off. And the edge of the glacier is the point where everything that has accumulated in the accumulation zone has gradually been whittled away until at this point it's all gone. That's what the edge of a glacier is. It's the point at which all the material which has accumulated has subsequently ablated away as the ice is moving outwards from the centre towards that margin. And here's a second illustration focusing on the accumulation area. This is the um, Columbia Glacier or the Columbia Ice Field in British Columbia and we're looking right at, again looking right at the top of the glacier here and you can see that in the accumulation area even in the summer when I took this photograph there's not much bare ice showing up here. There's a layer of snow surviving all the way through th into the summer and through the summer uh, and at the following year's snowfall is going to land on top of that snowfall. We're adding material, not losing material. That's what characterizes uh, the accumulation area. By contrast, here are some pictures uh, that I took in Greenland in the autumn. And in this location, I'm right down at the edge of the ablation area, right at the edge of the glacier, and it's the end of the summer. So even though this area would have been covered in snow all through the winter and up until April or, or May, in this area, all of that snow has melted away and all of the ice underneath it has been subjected to melting so that the ablation area is characterized in the summer and towards the end of the, of the summer by bare ice being exposed at the surface. And so the end of summer snow line is roughly equivalent to what we were talking about previously, the equilibrium line. At the end of the summer, the bare ice area is pretty much the ablation area and the area which has still got some snow cover on it at the end of the summer, that's pretty much the accumulation area. These photos also illustrate the, the end result, if you like, of the accumulation and compression and recrystallization of all that snow into glacier ice. The glacier ice that we're seeing here at the accumulation area, sorry, the ablation area, started its life up in the accumulation area as snow falling onto the surface of the glacier. That transformation of snow into glacier ice is right at the beginning of the story of our glaciers and it can take a variable amount of time. In some environments, transition from snow to ice can take as little as one year, one season. If conditions are warm, if snow is accumulating quickly, adding weight upon weight to the layers of snow beneath, and if melting and refreezing is occurring within the snowpack, that transformation of snowflakes into solid ice can be very quick. In other environments, if accumulation is slow, so the weight is being added on only very gradually, and if conditions are dry without any melting and refreezing of water into ice, then it can take as much as a thousand years or more for snow falling onto the surface to be buried, recrystallized, and gradually transformed into ice. A couple of the major differences between fresh snow and glacier ice are illustrated on this table. One of them is the density and another is the porosity. And we define glacier ice as distinct from fern, which is the intermediate stage between snow and ice. We start to call it glacier ice when all of the connections between the air pockets, between the, um, the bubbles have been sealed off. So glacier ice doesn't have connecting air passageways through it, it has sealed off bubbles within it. Whereas snow, on the other hand, has a very loosely uh, packed, very loose um, set of snowflakes with air uh, and air passageways in between them. 
The density of water is one kilogram per meter cubed. And an important figure to remember from this diagram is that even when it's completely formed, uh, glacier ice has a density less than water. And that's why ice floats in water because of that density difference. The specific mechanisms by which snow is transformed through fern and into ice uh, during the compression, the recrystallization. I'll let you read about that in the core text, uh, which runs through it in a quite straightforward way for you to pick up. This photograph that I took at the Athabasca Glacier shows some of the key characteristics that, di that differentiate glacier ice from snow. In the bottom left of the picture here, you can actually see a little bit of old packed snow that the glacier has, has run over. I'm looking at it here in a, in a little cavity at the glacier margin. So this is a little bit of, uh, of snow that the glacier has just run itself across. But higher up in the picture here, you can see a nice illustration of what glacier ice is like. You can even pick out on this picture individual crystals within the ice. Um, these crystals are about a centimetre across to give you some idea of scale and their edges are being picked out uh, by differential melting or sublimation, evaporation around the crystal boundaries. And so that crystalline form, we call it polycrystalline because ice is made up, glacier ice is made up of lots of little crystals all, all, all to, uh, joined together in the ice mass. It isn't one big crystal, it's lots of little crystals, polycrystalline. We call it foliated because glacier ice typically has these layerings or leavings within it, these foliations. And those foliations are dominantly flow related characteristics because as the ice deforms, ice with more or fewer bubbles in it deforms in slightly different ways and in much the same way that a metamorphic rock during its deformation can string out its component parts into streamers or foliations like this. That's what's happening in the glacier ice. The flow of the ice is streaming out the more and less bubble rich ice. And so that polycrystalline form and the foliations in the bubbles are characteristic of glacier ice. From a distance, this is what it ends up looking like. Here we have a 70 meter or so cliff of ice at the edge of the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, a lake again at the edge of the Greenland ice sheet with icebergs floating in it and here's some ice sliding across uh, bedrock. From a distance it looks, depending on the light, white or blue, sometimes with layers of debris within it as you can see in this um, image here. There's me for scale. But if you get up close to that and hack a little bit of it out then you get something that looks like this. We refer to it as bubbly white glacier ice. We call it white because from a distance, as you saw in the previous pictures, it looks white. But in fact, it's clear and it appears white or blue, depending on the light, because of the bubbles that are in it. We'll be saying more about whether ice is bubbly and white or not bubbly and full of debris uh, later on in the module when we talk about uh, basal debris, um, erosion underneath ice sheets and the entrainment of debris into the ice. But for now, we'll focus on the simple case where snow has transformed into ice and this is typically uh, what you'd expect it to look like. It's also important that you understand at least a little bit about the atomic structure of ice, not just for its own sake, but because this has a major bearing on how glaciers move, how ice deforms and flows. And this is a, a famous uh, figure taken from Patterson's book, The Physics of Glaciers. And it shows, if you like, a plan view and a cross-sectional view of the atomic structure of ice. Take some time to, to think this through and to have a look at the original uh, book if you get a chance. But what this is showing is that the atomic structure of ice is, well, Patterson described it as being like a stack of crinkled molecular sheets. I sometimes like to think of it as a, a pages in a book. And you can imagine it will be quite easy to deform this along that axis, so sliding the top layer here across the bottom layer here, but it will be a lot harder to bend it along that axis where you have these strengthening layers uh, across which you're trying to bend. 
And that atomic structure becomes very important later on when we talk about how glaciers move for exactly that reason. It's much easier to deform uh, an ice crystal uh, along that direction than it is to deform it along other directions. And that becomes very important when we talk about glacier flow later on. Another aspect of the physical layout, if you like, of the ice that becomes important later on is the nature of its polycrystalline um, structure and the vein network. Veins are essentially the gaps in between the crystals. Again, this is illustrated conveniently for you in the, in the main textbook. So have a look at these diagrams in the textbook and get your head around the way that when three ice crystals meet, the grain boundaries leave this vein. We're only talking maybe hundreds of microns, microns or hundreds of microns in here, but these veins exist in between the ice crystals. And in this top diagram, we've kind of removed all the ice and left you with a, a negative space image of just the gaps in between the ice. So this vein is represented by this channel here, and you can see where several veins meet. There are what we call nodes in the network. Now, if these were bigger, if we weren't just talking microns and hundreds of microns, you'd imagine that water would flow through this network and the ice would, would, would be able to transmit water. However, it doesn't work quite that way because these are so small. The liquid within them is often full of impurities and that prevents them from freezing up completely and the, the physics of small spaces enables um, water-like layers to remain in place in there and that does have an impact on the way that ice flows even though it doesn't really provide much of a conduit uh, for water to flow through. But again the idea of the vein network and the fact that there is liquid within that vein network will become important later on in the module. Uh, so it's another example of how the, the physical mechanical properties of ice are important in some of the processes that we'll be talking about when we think about glacier motion and the ways that glaciers can affect the landscapes over which they travel. So mass balance involving accumulation and ablation is a major control on the growth of glaciers and on the decay of glaciers. And based on these sessions in the associated reading and the research that, that, that you've done, there's a number of things that you need to make sure that you understand. Make sure you understand terms such as positive and negative mass balance, accumulation and ablation and the accumulation and ablation zones. Make sure you understand the different types of accumulation and the different types of ablation that can occur. Make sure you understand the equilibrium line and understand about the equilibrium line altitude. You also should be doing some reading and making sure that you understand how snow is transformed into ice by processes such as fernification. And you should recognize that glacier ice has specific physical properties that will become important to us later on when we start exploring how glaciers behave and how they affect landscapes. As with so many things in this module, a useful exercise for you to do would be to take yourself on a, a virtual field trip somewhere. And I've just suggested some um, coordinates here that you might take yourselves to, to have a little look around and try to discover for yourselves or try to recognize for yourselves accumulation area characteristics and ablation area characteristics on different glaciers around the world. So take yourself on a, on a Google Earth or Google Maps field trip and see if you can find some examples of the kinds of things that we've been talking about in these sessions.